Okay, we basically finished all the topics related to inheritance. Uh, let me just make some brief announcement quickly, and then we move on to the new topic for today. Okay, uh, just to let you know that I sent out an earlier announcement yesterday, just about we can have review sessions for you for the exam. So just go to the survey on the Moodle site, uh, complete the survey, so I will know your availability. Okay, complete this as soon as you can. And for the exam, make sure you catch up with the makeup collectures that we did so far. One is from November 15th, the other one from November 22nd. Okay, both are required for the exam. But it's being recorded, so catch up with them. If you've got questions, let me know. Okay, so what will be the topic for the rest of the course? Basically, so far, we spent quite a bit of time, many lectures on inheritance. That's definitely a very important part for OO. But now we want to switch the subject a little bit to basically talk about how efficient your code might be. So there's a topic called asymptotic analysis. Okay? Uh, if you see the title for the slides, asymptotic analysis. For those of you who took a 1019 previously or at the same time, asymptotic simply means when your program size gets to very large, which algorithm or which method should you choose? Let's say you got options, okay? That's basically the focus for the lecture. We might spend about two or a little bit more lectures on this topic here, but in 2011, in uh, 3101, you'll learn much more about it. So today, uh, for this course, is only for introduction. Okay, let's get to the subjects. It would be a little bit of math you have to worry about, but let's make it uh, gentle enough for you to follow. Okay, first of all, let's define the terms about algorithm and data structure. So what does it really mean? For example, for 2011, the, it's called fundamentals of data structure. What's really data structure? I would say array that you learn in this course, not array list, arrays, the primitive array. It's just one kind of data structure, okay? A data structure is simply a way for you to get access or to modify things in the data, right? How, how do we do that for the array? You simply pass the index of the array and try to get access to it or modify it, right? Very simple model. However, we will see later, array is very good, very efficient for uh, indexing or get access to the con uh, contents. But array is extremely inefficient for inserting or deleting because you might need some loop, okay? We'll get there later, later in the, uh, this lecture. Okay, so now, uh, of course, in late in 2011, you'll learn about another fundamental data structure called linked list. Well, I wouldn't say anything about it, but I'm just saying you will see that later. But every data structure have their limitation. For this course, as long as you know about the limitation for array, that'll be enough, okay? Okay, what about uh, also every time, why do you, you want to use a data structure? You want to solve some computational problem, okay? You can think about during your lab test, you were actually given some JUnit test. In some way, it specified a computational problem you want to solve. But a very typical one looks like this. Let's say you're given a sequence of n numbers, n numbers in there. N can be very uh, little, N can just be zero, which means you got empty sequence. Or N can be a million. That means you got a million integers over there, okay? That's the input. And then here's the output. Well, it looks a bit fancy, okay? Basically what we are saying is, what we really want to solve is a sorting problem. Given an integer array, which may, may or may not be sorted, we want to sort it in a non-descending order. But now, so far we haven't covered any algorithm of doing this. I'll try to show you, hopefully by the end of the course, three possible ways to do it, okay? We'll get there. And one is actually more efficient than the other two. Okay, okay and the instance of the problem can be, you just have a, uh, in, a list of integer. Of course, this is only one example. How do you know, let's say this, if I ask you to implement an algorithm, like a step-by-step -step method for sorting an integer list, how do you know how efficient your algorithm is? How do you know? That's something you want to be able to judge. That's yeah, something we'll cover in this lecture. Finally, what's an algorithm? Algorithm, you will learn much more in 3101, the design analysis of algorithm in 3101, but algorithm is just a step-by-step -step, uh, instructions for the computer to follow, okay? Uh, but to really present the algorithm in this course, we use Java, Java syntax. Okay, it's gonna be a solution and then uh, it's gonna be a sequence of steps, basically. And by the end of this lecture, given a particular algorithm, let's say we, we are given two different algorithms and they are trying to solve the same problem, how do you know which one you should choose? Given that both are correct, you should choose the one that's more efficient, time-wise, okay? That's something we'll get into. 
Okay, this uh, just sounds um, uh, uh, concepts for you. Okay, and finally, steps in an algorithm should really manipulate data structure. For example, in your lab test one and two, you are trying to manipulate primitive array, right? Okay. Okay. So now uh, let's go over a little bit more concept before we get to the math part, and then we'll see some code. Number one important criterion for your algorithm or for your methods will be correctness. Okay, correctness is number one. Okay, and of course, so far we use J units to assert the, uh, the correctness. And efficiency, so now uh, we talk about two kinds of efficiency. Okay, one is about time efficiency, like how long it would take for your method to execute, maybe five seconds versus 10 seconds, one minute versus 10 minutes, okay, just time. However, over here I try to be very concrete to say process the time, but later on we're gonna see how we can use mathematical function to measure the time. Okay, that's something we'll get into. Okay. And also space complexity, like how many uh, how many gigabytes are gonna use in order to execute algorithm? Okay, so time versus space. And now correctness, you can see we've got two criteria over here. One is about correctness, the other one is efficiency. Does it make sense to have a very efficient algorithm that is not correct? Absolutely not. I can definitely give you a very efficient algorithm for sorting a million integer, very efficient. I will simply print out hello world. And it doesn't do anything useful, right? So efficiency is important, but only under this uh, assumption it is correct. Okay, correctness is still the priority, okay? Just to emphasize that. And then what about efficiency? Do you think uh, time or space matter more? Mm, I would say, at least for this course, we're assuming that you, you actually got a reasonable uh, amount of memory for you to use. It's actually quite cheap these days. But I think it's still, we want to focus more on the time. Okay? Especially, what would be the asymptotic upper bound of your algorithm? That's something we'll see. Okay, so now, so far, we say correctness is always the number one criteria. Okay? Number two, uh, we don't worry too much about space. Not too much, okay? mainly the time. Let me give you one example very quickly, okay? Of course, uh, okay, just a bit more concept. We are more interested in the time as opposed to storage, but now the running time of your method typically depends on different kind of uh, uh, factors, okay? So one is about the size, the other one is about the structure. What do I mean? Let's say, I'll give you a very simple example. So now, what would be the efficient, uh, time efficiency for algorithm? So time efficiency of your algorithm, okay, so I'll go here, okay? Depends on two things. Let's say, for example, we are trying to sort an array of integers. So there are mainly two factors, because the input can be a very uh, many possibilities, right? So one factor would be the size. So for example, if I talk about an array of size one, versus an array of size million, all the way to one million minus one. Apparently you would know that this one takes much shorter time, right? Because you'll be done right away. So size really matters. So later on when we try to analyze your uh, method, you, we always think about when the size goes towards uh, infinity, what's gonna be the time, okay? Number two is more interesting. Number two is about the structure. Let's say, for example, if you have an array of size uh, four, for example, okay? Let's say one array is already sorted uh, four, three, two, one, let's say in the de uh, decreasing order. Another array is simply not exactly sorted. Apparently, this one that's already sorted will take less time, right? Just uh, conceptually. So the structure of your input also matters sometimes. Okay, just, um, just talking about in general, there are two factors. One about size, one about structure. And when you analyze the algorithm, you should really talk about both, okay? Quickly. Okay, nothing about a specific example just yet, but we will get to. Okay, so now how do you determine the running time of an algorithm, okay? So now we're gonna see two approaches. The first one is very naive. It's basically what you would do in high school. How do you know if certain phenomenon is gonna occur, you go to the laboratory and then try to do some ex experiment, right? So now the same. If you want to know method one versus method two, which one is more efficient, you simply run them on the computer, hopefully the same machines with the same workload, and see which one is gonna run faster. 
So that would be the first approach. You simply measure the time via experiments. Okay, we'll do that together. And then number two, which is what you should do as a computer scientist, to say I don't necessarily have to run my methods on a computer. Just by looking at the pseudocode or abstract idea about the method on the paper, I can already determine. That's kind of the stage we, will, we would like you to reach on number two. Okay, we'll get there. But let's do number one first, just to get some idea. So I'm gonna give you a very simple problem over here, okay? I will, uh, let me talk about how we can measure that. You can try that as well. Basically, we're gonna have this fragment of code very easy. Basically, we're gonna say system the current time milliseconds, start time, and we're gonna run the algorithm, either method one or method two. And then after, upon the termination of the method, we're gonna say what's the end time, and then calculate the difference. For example, let's say if you start your method one when it's millisecond five, and then when you fit, terminate your algorithm, it's millisecond 10. So the, the last time should be 10 minus five, right? Something like that. So now we can run this, the same fragment of code by using method one versus method two and see which one gives you a smaller number for elapsed time, okay? That's kind of the idea. Okay, nothing tricky, okay? And then after that, you can visualize the result, right? To see which one's better. And now, here's the tricky thing. As I said before, whenever you're trying to write your JUnit test, you want to be as complete as possible. Of course, this course is not really about software testing, but at least you should cover certain boundary cases, you know, whether, for example, H, uh, if X is zero or X is less than zero, you know, et cetera, okay? Anyway, so when you want to do such uh, experiment, make sure you cover enough data points in your data set, okay? All right, and then we get to some concrete example. Let's say this is our problem, okay, very easy. Let's say we have a method there, and the method is gonna take a single character C, and then it's gonna take an integer, a 32-bit uh, integer. And then the output is just going to be a single string. For example, if I say I want to repeat the star character 15 times, that'll be one possible input, and the output will just be 15 stars on the terminal, okay, on the console. Everybody clear about what the problem is? Okay, let me now give you two possible methods to solve it. Look at that, and then let's have some intuition about which one might be more efficient, and then I'll, I'll show you the experiment result, okay? Let's see the first one. The first one here basically is about, uh, you know what, let me switch the iPad so we can see more clearly, okay? The first one over here, uh, okay, let me see this. The first one, algorithm number one, we're basically using concatenation, basically what you did back in 1022, you know, throughout. We simply say this particular code repeat one, character and integer, okay? We're just going to run a loop, and then every time we're simply gonna say plus equal the character to the end of the string, concatenation, okay? What about another possibility? Let's say another one, uh, I'm not sure if you have used a classical string builder. If you have not, that's okay. I just want to show you. There's a Java library class called String Builder. So what you would do is I call it repeat two, okay, version number two. The parameters are exactly the same, and then I still run a loop over here. What it does is it's simply going, going to call, okay, SB is of type String Builder. I simply append the character C to the end of it. You can see I'm using either string concatenation over here, or I'm using the append in the string builder. Okay, that's the two methods to achieve the same goal. But now our goal is to decide, before we run the experiment, which one do you think is more efficient? Just take a guess, take a guess. I think the second one, I'm not sure about the string builder class itself. Uh, string, oh, you know what, uh, to be fair, Guys, to be fair, let me tell you a little bit about how each one works. I think that'll be more fair to, for you to do a comparison. Uh, for the first one over here, let me just write it out to you, okay? The first one, when we say plus equal, you wouldn't disagree if I say answer is assigned to answer plus C, right? So that means the right-hand side must be calculated first before we can assign to the left-hand side, right? Let's say, for example, if this is a current answer, which is referring to some very long string, like over here. And then I'm trying to append character C over here. What that will do is, first of all, it's going to create a temporary string before we can assign to the final answer. 
and then it's going to create this temporary string, and then somehow duplicates the existing orange string, and then apparent character C to the end. After that, answer is going to be reassigned to the temp. That basically has to be done for every uh, iteration. Okay, that's the first solution. The second one works a little bit differently. The second one, apparently we are trying to create a string builder objects, okay? So let's say SB is now pointing to a string builder objects, string builder objects, okay? It might simply got something called S, conceptually S string, okay? Every time you're trying to append a character, let's say ex uh, the existing string goes uh, something like this. If I want to add a new string character C, I don't need to create any temporary string. I simply append that to the end. That's it. Keep appending, basically. Okay, it seems to you, maybe intuitively, would you agree, the second one seems to be faster. But why would that be faster? Yeah, go ahead. Apparently, yeah, when you create a temp, number one, it's gonna take space. Number two, we're gonna copy over the string character by character. So intuitively, you're gonna use a loop to create a temp, right? You mean the algorithm two? Oh, to, oh, you know what? That one is actually to be done at the end, so that one doesn't count. I'm just talking about each iteration, what would you do, right? Okay, let's uh, make a mini conclusion before we run the experiment, okay? Basically, we agree that according to how they're gonna work, this guy over here, you're gonna create a temp which involves copying the existing string using a loop character by character into this guy here and then put it to the end, okay? That one's gonna be less efficient, but how bad is it? That's the question, okay? Uh, without really running that on my computer, okay, that will take too long, so I'll just show you the result, okay? I kind of got this uh, result from the textbook, so I'm just quoting them, okay? Let me just see, uh, show you some slides over here. Okay, so we got these two algorithms over here. So now let's do some table, right? That's what you have to do to, at the end to make a report. The uh, leftmost column here, the end, is about how many times you're gonna repeat a character, okay? For example, initially, let's say 50,000 times. Repeat one, using string a concatenation with a, a temporary string will take about 3,000 milliseconds versus one. But you know, it might be okay, right? I mean, 3,000 milliseconds versus one millisecond, you, can, you may not be able to tell the difference. But the idea is input has to grow very large. If you grow to uh, 100,000, it's now 7,000 versus one. So I'm basically trying to keep doubling the input size, right? Let's go a little bit further. When I go to 200,000, it's like this, right? It's like a 39,000 milliseconds versus two. You might gradually can see the difference, okay? Let me show you what the conclusion is. Eventually, I will get to one, 12 million. In that case, it takes about three days for the first one to complete. But the first one, still 135 milliseconds. Okay, now you can see, sometimes on a small scale, you may not be able to really tell the difference between two methods, but the idea is you really have to increase the size of the input to get it realistic. Okay, that's a lesson, okay? That's why I don't wanna try this in front of you, unless you're willing to stay for three days, right? All right, good. Anyway, uh, yeah, it's only for your reference, just get the idea. I think, uh, don't worry about the numbers over here. One thing I do want you to notice though, is, is this. If you try to observe uh, you can see over here, I'm basically trying to uh, double you know, the size of the input over here, basically every time, just two times, two times, two times, okay? Can you see any rate of change for repeat one versus repeat two, just roughly? So, roughly speaking, okay, it's not really long, actually, not, not that complicated. I would say the rate of change for repeat one and repeat two, they are basically linear. Roughly speaking, every time I double the size of n, you can see from seven to 39, roughly, it's about five times of change, versus from one to two, it's about two times of change, roughly speaking. And over here, to, if you go from 69 to about 20, 20 uh, to this number over here, that's also about five times, right? Just roughly speaking. So they remain to be linear. But the difference is 
the slope for the rate of change for repeat one is higher, right, than the first, second one. Okay, good. So now, if you see, that's why I want to explain this diagram to you. If you think about the white one over here is repeat one. Apparently, it takes more time than the blue one, which is repeat two, but they are both linear. Just one is about maybe x, uh, y is a, uh, one is about y equals five uh, x. The other one is y equals two x. Okay, just uh, that difference there. So to really appreciate this particular lecture here, you may want to review just a little bit about some linear algebra, a little bit. But we'll do review on the lecture anyway, just a little bit. Okay. Guys, are we okay so far? Okay, that's the only experiment we're gonna do on the, uh, to show you the exact running time. But we're gonna criticize on this, okay? So now, we wanna say, are you really want to, do you really want to do this kind of experiments? for every method you want to decide whether I should go for a solution one or should I go for the solution two? Do I really want to do that, right? The answer is probably not. Let's try to, try to see what's the drawback for this particular approach. Okay, number one, if you want to run, uh, record the running time, that means your Java code must compile. And also, it must be correct, it must be fully implemented. This may be a disadvantage to, to us because maybe what you want to do is to see I have sketch of two solutions, one versus two. Which one should be adopted eventually before I try to implement the code? So this particular uh, requirements over here that your code must be fully implemented in order to run experiments is quite a disadvantage, okay? That's number one. So later on, when you see me show you some code, although they are fully implemented, but we don't necessarily have to run them on a computer. Okay, so that's the difference. So it would be very nice if somehow we can just sketch the code and then try to see what the running time is. It would be very nice, okay? Number two, that's also, this more, uh, that's more severe. Let's say I try to run repeat number one on my Mac and repeat two on your Windows machine. Is it a fair comparison? Not necessarily because maybe the hardware might be different. Maybe my machine is older than yours and also the operating system, how they schedule the task under the hood may also be different. So you're not really comparing Apple to Apple, okay? So hardware and software is also something you want to control. I can tell you that even if you try to run the two methods on prison lab machines, even though you do that, but depending on the load of the machine at the same time, so it might also be different, okay? So this is not a good idea to run experiments. Okay, and also for number three, uh, when we run experiments, you also want to make sure your test cases are really complete. You don't miss any boundary cases. Or put it another way, have you really considered the worst case scenario? You don't really want to consider best, uh, best case scenario always. Always the worst case. We'll get there. Okay. okay, so these are some limitations over here. Okay, so now what would be the better approach? The better approach should be, so now we want to measure relative efficiency. When I say relative, I mean you don't have to worry about the absolute running time. How many milliseconds exactly? We don't have to, okay? We simply go into the code and somehow count the number of operations you have. We'll see exactly how to do that in some exercise. Okay, and then let's see this. So now we're gonna go in this way. Number one, we talk about the notion about primitive operation. Well, I'll define exactly what primitive operations are. And then given a particular method, we're gonna count precisely. Let's do that exercise first. And then the next step would be, we try to approximate the running time using uh, some, some function, okay? And then number three, we're gonna focus on worst case scenario, okay? So these are the three things you're gonna learn eventually. Guys, are we okay so far? Okay, I know today's a little bit, you know, no, uh, no more inheritance, no more OO, you know, for this lecture, okay? Just about code complexity. All right, let's count the primitive operation. Let's get some idea. What's really primitive com uh, operation? You can think about primitive operation are the, the most basic operation that you want to execute on your computer. And they basically take constant time. And the amount of time you will take for every machine to execute a particular primitive operation is very similar, okay? And later, uh, if you take 2021 uh, at some point, you know, the assembly language course, you can think about each instruction is like a primitive operation. You can think of it, okay? Okay, let's talk about all the uh, primitive operation we'll consider. 
then what, uh, number one is about assignments, okay? If you try to assign a value to some variable, it's primitive. Oh, by the way, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be primitive value. Even if you say A is assigned to B, where A and B are reference type, that's okay, because you're only copying address, okay? Also, if you want to index, index it into the array, it's only about lookup, the memory address, so that's also primitive, okay? And also, if you try to do some arithmetic, relational, or logical operation using these operators, that's also primitive, okay? It's very easy, uh, very efficient to calculate at a hardware level. And also, if you want to get access to a particular attributes, as I uh, visualized before, you just look up the uh, memory address for the objects and go there. That's also primitive. Okay, if you want to return from a method, that's also um, primitive. Did you see anything missing here? Anything you, you think that's missing here that we keep using? For example, over there you can see accessing an attribute of an object. I say acc.balance. What about acc.m, where m is a method? I didn't have anything uh, listed here as a primitive operation, right? But now the question is, can I say a method call in general is a primitive operation? Can I? Yeah, exactly. Maybe M. Let's say I let's say I talk about two method calls. It's O.M1 versus O.M2. O.M1 may be just printing hello world. O.M2 might be to sort a million sized uh, integers list, right? So method call in general cannot be counted as primitive. You have to deep further to see what the detail is for the method. Okay, that's really important to know. Ah, that's also on the slides. Okay, so why method call it should not be there in general because it might be a call to some cheap method or might be a call to some expensive method, right? It depends, okay, that's why. Guys, make sense so far? Okay, I'll give you 10 seconds just to review the list over here quickly, okay? We'll do one example in detail altogether, okay? <clears throat> just to remind, uh, try to uh, remind yourself always what's considered primitive, okay? Okay, if you want me to review the list, we can do that later. But for now, we're gonna look at the following exercise. Let's consider this fragment of code, only seven lines. Um, before I do anything, okay, actually, okay, let's see this. Okay, don't worry about these two questions just yet. You don't have to worry, just for now, okay? Let's go over line by line quickly. Line number one, I simply declare find max, okay? So now, by the way, this is an integer, uh, integer array. So now, integer n, so this is just some auxiliary parameter, just extra, okay? So now, I'll just make a note over here. n should be the same as a dot length. So it's easier for us to see what's the efficiency according to the uh, size of the array, okay? Okay, line number two, we simply assign the current max to be the first element in the array, okay? That's line number two. And then, having that, uh, we're gonna start with the second elements of the array until we reach the end. And then we're gonna, uh, for each loop, we'll simply say if the current one we are looking at is larger than the current maximum, then we replace the maximum. And then, make sure you increment i, eventually return the current max, okay? Very easy, I'm pretty sure every one of you can do it. We're going to use this uh, small example to see how we can count the precise number of primitive operations, depending on the size of the array. Question. The i++, no, it's actually, you know what? It's not outside the for loop, you know. If you, it's good that you ask. In case you got confused, notice that if is here, right? This is a closing of the if, right? And then after this, we got i++. And this is a closing of the for loop. Make sense? Uh, the reason that I put the brackets over here is because I'm, I was running out of space. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay. But guys, any question about the clarity of the code? I want to make sure you're okay. But I++ is definitely in parallel to the if, right? It's not outside the for, okay? So now, before we try to answer how many primitive operations precisely we have, Let's answer two questions over here. Okay, that might be a nice review on the loops. Okay, two questions for you. 
let's uh, one at a time. Question number one, can you tell me precisely line number three? You can see this i less than n over here to be checked, right? How many times is this particular expression being executed? How many times exactly? Any answer you want to pop up to me? I heard n minus one. Anybody else? You can disagree. That's okay. You you said n, okay? Pretty close. But you know, since now we talk about precise, right? We gotta be exact. So we're gonna make a decision: n minus one or n. Okay, we're gonna see. Okay, you got questions? Hmm? You believe there should be n minus two? Okay, we got another. Guys, one thing I want to note. Since now our purpose is really to get things precise, so that's why I, so either there should be n minus one, n minus two, n matters. But later on, once we get to the end of the lecture, either this, this, or this, if you talk about asymptotically, doesn't really matter, minus one or minus two, doesn't matter. But you know, let's be precise at the moment, okay? Now, how do we trace? Okay, let's see this. Let's say, for example, we talk about an integer array of size 10, let's say. So now, if you try to draw a table over here, i over here, and then i less than n is going to be a Boolean, agree? Okay, so now, what's gonna be the value of i the very first time you try to evaluate this expression? One, would you agree? Okay, because you can see i is assigned, uh, initialized to be one, right? One, and now, one less than 10 would just be true. So that means we can go into loop for the first time. So now, as long as the uh, condition is true, we're gonna stay in the loop, okay? When that's two, two less than 10, also true, right? So let me keep going for the second iteration. We go all the way to, what would be the last value of i that's going to make i less than n true? Nine, right? Okay. Nine, and then nine less than 10, is going to be true, okay? And do we have to evaluate this for another time? Well, remember, you only exit from the loop when this condition evaluated to false. So you still need one more time, okay? You see what I mean? Make sense? Because if this is only true, that means you're not terminating yet. So now, when i is incremented to 10, so now 10 less than 10 will not be false. So this is the last time. Basically, I'm not sure if you ever got this insight into the for loop. The condition there, you're trying to evaluate, keep evaluating true until you get to the false, and then you exit from the loop. Okay, so now let's think about it. So now, uh, well, 10 is exactly the n over here that we talk about, so, so it should be n times, okay, n times. Guys, any question about this? You can think about the first n minus one time. So now let me just draw a little bit of notes for you. You want to think about this. You can think about n minus one times i less than n, evaluate to true. And then the nth time i less than n is going to evaluate to false. That means now time to terminate. Okay, n times. Okay, let's keep that in mind. So this guy here is gonna be evaluated n times, exactly. Question number two. If you look at the body of the loop over here, from line four to line six, how many times are we going to execute the body of the loop? n times, n minus one times, n plus one times? Huh? Don't guess, please, don't guess. This should be n minus one, because think about when would you actually execute the body of the loop. It's basically when you are in the loop. So that means when the condition is actually true. So now, over here, so these are the number of times you're gonna uh, evaluate the body of the loop. So that would be n minus one times. Okay, so this guy here would be uh, n minus one times. 
it's very subtle but very important for you to realize. Okay? So it really depends on how we ask you questions in the exam. If we want you to calculate precisely how many times a particular fragment of code is going to be executed, such subtlety matters. If that's only about asymptotically, what's the efficiency? Then it does not matter too much. Okay? Depends. Okay? Any question about n versus n minus 1 over here? We okay? All right, I assume you're okay. But study that, and then talk to me if you got a problem. Let's go back to the slides. So we already answered the, most, uh, the two most fundamental questions for this uh, example here. Okay, I'll make a, make a sign. This is the note, okay? So now we're going to count the number of primitive operations one line after another, okay? For uh, line number one, we don't have to count. It's the only header of the method. Line number two, how many primitive operations do we have? Or think about, e oh, let me put it this way. When you try to execute find max method, how many primitive operations will end up being executed? How many for line number two? two. I heard two, which two? Uh, indexing into the array at position zero and assignments. Exactly, so indexing into the array at position zero and also assignments, right? That's how you count, okay? That's two, and then exactly one indexing, one assignment, okay? Now, what about line number three? Think about it. That's why I ask you those two questions first to help you. I can tell you that the answer is not two. It's not two. You want to think about, in general, if you try to execute find max with arbitrary n value, how many times, how many primitive operations that will be uh, they'll end up being executed when you, uh, when you execute line number three. Huh? 20? Oh, but why, why, why would you get 20? But now we don't know what n is. Oh, so don't, don't, don't worry about n being 10. So we just say in general. Huh? 2 plus n, okay? Let's try to think about it, okay, before I show you the answer. Okay, this guy here is a little bit interesting here. Let me highlight it. So we talk about line number three over here, right? Okay, so now, first of all, would you agree? This guy over here is gonna be one, right? Okay, this one is one. What about, how many times is this going to be executed? N, right? That's something we already said, so N plus one. So this part here is only going to be executed just once to initialize a loop counter. And this condition here will be evaluated n minus one times being true. And the one time being true. Oh, sorry, one time being false at the end. Okay, so n plus one. Okay, that's really, really important, n plus one. Okay, one assignment plus m comparison, okay? What about line number four? How many times would this be executed? First of all, how many times would this if statement condition be checked? It depends on how many iterations you're gonna get, right? In that case, n minus one, as we said before, okay? And then for that particular line number four, how many primitive operations do we have? Two, agree? Yeah, so you can see over here, let me again go back here. If you look at that, this is an indexing over here, and also, it's a comparison over here, right? So two. So two, and we know that the body of the loop is gonna be executed for n minus one times, right? So two times n minus one. Okay, that's how you figure, okay? We're just being very precise over here. Okay, what about line number five? So now, line number five is interesting. Over here, you might be thinking that, well, it depends on the structure of the array, right? Maybe you will only enter the if branch when the condition at line number four is true. But now, usually when you want to count, you think about the worst case. Let's say it just happened that we have to execute this line number five every iteration. That'll make it easier to think about. Line number five itself, how many? Also two, right? Uh, to position i, and also the assignment. So again, it's gonna be two times n minus one, okay, the same, very good. <coughs> what about line number six, what's i plus plus? 
Well, how many primitive operations are there for I plus plus? Why would there be two? Well, one is arithmetic and one is yeah, because you think about I, <clears throat> you think about it over here, I plus plus is equivalent to I is assigned to I plus one, right? I plus one is one primitive operation, and assignment here is just another one, so two in total, okay? So, also, n minus one times two. What about line number seven? n minus one? Well, just one, right? It's already outside the loop. Okay. Okay, so that's kind of the exercise you have to know how to do if the question is to ask you about the precise number of primitive operations, okay? So now, finally, we're gonna add them up together. You're gonna add up two plus n plus one and plus all these n plus one, okay? This is the answer you will get, uh, seven n minus two, okay? So let's don't lose the big picture. What does that really mean? Eventually, what we get, uh, let me write it down here. What we're saying is, the number of primitive operation precisely is 7n minus 2, okay? Just to remind yourself. What that means is, so this is essentially a function which depends on the size of the array. So now, think about if uh, the size of the array, okay, find max integer array over here, A, and also integer the size n, okay? And then what we just did is to calculate how many primitive operation, it's 7n minus two, okay? So now, think about what this really means. What this means is, n over here is going to be, uh, and then also the running time, I'll say RT, like a primitive operation, okay? If n is equal to 10, we got 68, precisely. If you, n is actually 100, you get 698, you know, etc. Okay, that's what that means. But now you can see the number over there, the precise number may not be so important. What's really important is about how the function looks like. It's like a linear, right? For example, later on you will see. If somehow I have another alternative to you, and somehow it's 6n squared minus 100, for example. Would you think the pink one is better or the blue one is better? The pink one turned out would be better because when input size gets very large, when you want to calculate n squared, it's going to calculate to be substantially larger than just n. Okay? That's what we said asymptotically. Okay? That's something we'll get into. Okay, so so far what you're supposed to know, number one, uh, given, given a fragment of code, calculate precise number of operations, primitive operations, and then understand what 7n minus two over here really means. It's usually a function depending on the size uh, of your algorithm, and typically for this core, just array, okay? But later on, when you get to 2011, for example, n over here might be either the size of the array, the size of a linked list, the size of a tree, the size of a graph, so it's a very general mechanism we are learning. Okay, but for this course, just an array, okay? Let's go on. So now we want to go a little bit further over here. Let's uh, just see another slide here. We just calculated that we got basically, uh, let me show you this equation over here. Okay, for the fine max, we say that the number of primitive operations is simply gonna be seven n minus two. Let's say if it takes about time t for a particular platform, either Mac OS or Windows, to execute uh, each single primitive operation. So how do we calculate absolute running time? It simply is 7n minus two times t, right? That's what, what you would do. And now, let's say this. If I got two different algorithms, one is 7n minus two, the other one takes precisely 10n plus three primitive operations. And for both of them, we just multiply by t. And now if you see this, does the value of t really matter over here? It doesn't quite matter over here because what really matters is the equation itself, okay? 
So let me just write this down quickly. Okay. If you come, we're trying to compare running time. Okay. 7n minus 2. And then let me be consistent 10n plus 3. Okay, again, this is the number of primitive operations. And this is just another number of primitive operations. And then we're saying that each one of them is going to multiply by t. t is the time that would take to execute each primitive operation. So now, how do we know which one is larger? Well, does t really matter? It's just a, it's just a factor that's constant. So you don't really have to worry about it, basically. So that means you don't have to worry about the absolute running time. All you got to worry about is we call that the relative running time. Okay, but really to really jump to this conclusion, how we jump to this conclusion is really important because you don't have to worry about the uh, absolute uh, running time for each primitive operation because they simply don't matter. Okay, only the relative one. And later on, we can actually see when the equation gets more complicated, how can we tell which one is more efficient, right? That's something we'll see. Okay, so you only compare 7n minus 2 against 10n plus 3, okay? Okay, time efficiency. Okay, so now let me give you a little bit <coughs> more uh, informal uh, judgment base over here. Whenever you see an equation over here, 7n minus 2, the way to look at that is to rewrite it in a way that is going to sort the highest power to the lowest power. I'll give you another example. If somehow the running time or the number of primitive operation you got looks like this. 2 plus 4n cubed plus 2n squared plus 3n. Let's say that's what you have over here, right? This is not somehow sorted according to the power, okay? So I would suggest you, you write it in such a way, okay? The highest power is apparently over here, right? 4n cubed plus the next one is square. 2n square plus, so this is like a power 1, 3n plus 2. So this is like an n to the power of 0, right? OK. So this is how you should rewrite it, at least in your mind, to actually see. So once you get this particular sort of form, so what's so important about it? In order to really decide what's going to be the term that matters the most, you should really focus on the highest power term, OK, over here. So this is highest power. Or in other words, the highest power is going to dominate over all the other lower terms. Okay, there's some terminology I would like to explain very quickly. Okay, you can see this is lower, like a two. This is also lower. That's one, and this is also lower. That's zero. They are all lower terms. Okay, and um, there's another thing that's called multiplicative constants. Okay. Basically, you can see over here, 4 over here, 2 over here, 3 over here, and also 1 over here, right? So these are called multiplicative constants. Okay? Multiplicative constants. Okay, that's also some terms you should really know. Okay, not difficult. Okay, okay let's go back here. <clears throat> Okay, you talk about highest power, you talk about lower term also multiplicative constants. That's something we'll use, especially when you want to do some proof okay, later. Okay, so now when you are trying to approximate a function, okay, how do you approximate that? We're gonna talk about big O very soon. Okay? The, uh, of course, it depends on what you what we'll ask you about. If you simply just want you to give me the big O function, you can just uh, look at the highest power. But to really prove it, you're gonna choose something carefully. Okay, we'll see. Okay, anyway, if you want to approximate the function, look at the highest power that actually dominates over all the lower terms. Okay, okay. Uh, also, the multiplicative constant and lower terms can just be dropped. What that means is, 
over here. Since this is the highest power, what I can do is I can drop this guy here, drop this guy here, drop this guy here. They're all lower terms. I can also drop the multiplicative constant for n cube. What I get eventually is n cube. So this is the eventual asymptotic upper bound for my running time. Okay? Uh, but I'm doing, doing this just informally for now. Okay? I'm going to do it more formally a little bit later. Okay? So this is the, the eventual asymptotic upper bound. Okay, let's go a little bit further. Okay, so now uh, this one very similar. You can see this one is not exactly sorted, but you can see the highest power is n to the power of 2, right? That's the highest power. And then you can also see what the multiplicative constant is, the 7 here, the 2 here, and the 3 over here, right? And also what the lower terms are, okay? That's also easy. Yeah, so far nothing difficult. Okay, so now I think we're getting to big O, just next slides. Oh, okay, so just want to show you a little bit more about uh, the usual function you run into, not just in this course, but also in later courses. This would be something you will hope that your method is going to achieve, this kind of learning, uh, this kind of uh, uh, running time. What does constant really mean? That means your algorithm, regardless of the input size, getting to very large or very small, you always take a constant amount of time to return. That would be the ideal, but it doesn't happen often because if you, the problem you're trying to solve is non-trivial, you cannot necessarily get constant time algorithm. Okay, but it's constant here, and also log two n. Um, maybe we will we will be able to talk about binary search in the, our last class. So binary search is a, a very typical algorithm with a, a log n. Okay, but whenever we talk about log in this course, we mean base two, okay, not base ten, because computer is a binary form. Okay, and also we got uh, linear over here, and also we got quadratic, and also we got cubic, and also exponential. Exponential is really the worst case you can get into. That means you're basically trying to do the brute force way to do things together, okay? Okay, we'll do a little bit of exercise on the log today, okay? That, that possibly will help. I'm pretty sure you're comfortable, comfortable with other uh, formulas here. Okay, and then, so this one just to tell you, you got three options you may take when you analyze the runtime. Either you talk about worst case time, or you talk about best case time, or you talk about average case time, okay? For this course, we're going to focus on just the worst case to think about what will be the most running time your method can really achieve, okay? Can you think about why not best case time? Why best case time may not be very useful? Yeah, exactly. For example, let's say sorting an array. If the array is of t uh, size zero, constant time, you return the empty array right away. Exactly. So worst case would be the most important thing to look at. But for the average case, it's out to, to give you a very tight uh, asymptotic upper bound. But this one involves certain uh, statistics about expected value. But we're not going to cover that. It's too complicated. Okay, not in this course. So what we'll do is worst case. Okay, big O. Okay, asymptotic analysis, we're simply going to talk about when the size is uh, grows towards the limits, uh, towards the uh, infinity. Okay, I'm going to see how the running time is going to change. For example, over here, if you look at n versus n squared, what you really want to have in your mind is something like this. Okay, I'll show it to you. If I say running time, number one is simply n, linear. Running time number two is simply going to be uh, n squared. Okay, it's quadratic. Okay, how you can think about it is like this. Think about this is the input size. This is the running time. Okay, let me just change the color of this so that's easier for you to see. Okay, let's say this. Okay, we got red, we got blue. The red one is basically just going to be linear, like that, okay? So now, basically, you can think about quadratic over here, asymptotically, this is strictly higher than power of one. So that means when you try to draw it, it's gonna be something like this, something like that. So there's no way for this particular 
uh, algorithm to compare with this when it goes towards the limit. The running time is just substantially smaller for the red one. Okay, that's, that's basically every comparison you're trying to do, think of that picture in your mind, okay, asymptotically. Okay, we're gonna see definition for big O very soon. Okay, and whenever you want to, uh, let me just do one more example with you, okay, and let's see how we can do it. Uh, have a look at RT1 over here and RT2. I'm gonna copy that to my iPad, and then we'll talk about it. RT1, three N squared plus seven N plus 18, and also RT2, 100, n squared plus 3n minus 100, okay? So now, how do we know which one is more efficient, okay? Conceptually, you're gonna drop all the lower terms and all the multiplicative constant. How do you do that? So he, over here, RT1, highest term is over here. Drop the multiplicative constants and drop all the lower terms. What you get is n squared, okay? And then for uh, RT2 over here, let's do something similar. So now, drop the multiplicative constant for the highest power, drop all the lower terms, you also get n squared. So n squared versus n squared. Asymptotically, they are the same, okay? All right, and then, if you see another one, you can see this one here, n cubed. And this one, if, uh, this one here, you can see it's n squared. Even though the multiplicative constant is 100, which is much larger than one, but it doesn't matter. Asymptotically, n cubed is gonna dominate. It's gonna be substantially higher eventually, okay? All right, I think next slide will be about the, about the big O, okay? Then we're gonna review the definition. Okay, for this course, we'll simply just do the uh, so-called big O notation. So that one's gonna be asymptotic upper bound. There's another two called omega and also theta. So these two might be covered more in 2011 and 3101, but for this course, only the asymptotic upper bound, okay? How many of you have seen big O already? How many of you? Okay, so I think I'll just review the definition anyway, okay, just as a brush up, and then we're gonna apply that to some code together, okay? What I would do is, I'm gonna show you directly some diagram, okay? And then we'll, we'll get to the definition. So this is how you can understand the big O notation. I try to summarize everything here. Okay, and also we'll do one example. Think about this guy here. The green one, let's say this is the running time of your algorithm. And then, we want to decide the asymptotic upper bound for that. How do we do that, okay? Here's the idea. Uh, before I get it, how about just do one example quickly with you, okay? Let's say if I know the running time of my um, algorithm is simply f of n, a n plus five, let's say, okay? And then I want to somehow to know whether n would be the asymptotic upper bound for my f n. How do I know that, right? Somehow I want to prove. I want to prove that f of n, which is over here, is big O of g of n, which is n. Okay, that's kind of the thing you have to keep encountering. encountering. Let's see how we can do that. Before I get back to the diagram over here, let's see this particular example quickly, okay? So this diagram is not exactly to the scale, but hopefully that will illustrate, okay? Again, if you look at, this is my algorithm, okay? This is the running time of my algorithm. And if you look at the red one, okay, so this guy over here is the candidates for me to prove the asymptotic upper bound. Okay, I'll write it down. Okay, here. So now, this is, we wanna say f of n is the big O of g of n. Is that the case? Okay. It would be the case if we can somehow increase the slope of g of n in a way, and then it's going to asymptotically dominate the running time, the green one. Okay. For example, if you look at this particular blue one over here, 
When I say increase the slope, I simply mean multiply the function by some constant, right? So now if you look at this guy here, the blue one. If you consider this one here that we talked about in the very beginning, that's g of n. And this one that's strictly steeper is g of n times 9. Okay? So now, if you consider this line, which is our algorithm, versus this particular steeper slope that's originated from g of n, at some point, you can see specifically from this particular points, you can see, okay, I'm going to write it down here. So now, when n, the input size, is larger than or equal to 5, right? you can see this 5 over here. So what's going what's to happen? So that means f of n is less than or equal to 9 times g of n. As long as there's such a point that beyond which your uh, multiply, your actually uh, steeper version of g of n is going to upper bound the original function, then you'll be fine. That's the upper bound. Actually, we okay with this? Okay. Now, let's go back to the definition quickly, and then we're going to do some exercise. Okay. If we go back to this particular guy here, let's see what the definition is. Every time you have your, your particular function f of n over here, you would say it's, <coughs> by the way, this is a member of. <coughs> it's a member of big O of g of n if you can find a constant over here called c, and also you can find certain starting point n0. <coughs> Excuse me. Such that f of n would just be, just be less than or equal to C multiplies G of N. So if you look at the diagram again, this is a starting point. Starting point <coughs> from which C times G of N can <coughs> upper bound F of N. You can see there's a gap over here, right? You can see there's a gap. Okay, mathematically that's what it, <coughs> what it is saying. As long as as long as you can find out this n zero over here, and also you can find out the c, okay, then that'll be okay. Okay. <coughs> Any question about this? Should we do some exercise? Yes. Question. <coughs> Aha, good question. Can you say, okay, apparently here we say big, um, yeah, you go, you're jumping a little bit ahead. Let's think about what big O is, first of all, okay? When I say big O of N, what does that really mean? So that means all the functions a set of functions, basically, or functions that can be upper bounded by n multiply certain c. Right, this is c we just talked about, okay? So now, if you think about it, it's a set. Let's think about it. If I say this is big O of n, what can be there? For example, can 2n be there? Yes, I can choose maybe c to be 3, for example, right? Can maybe 3n plus 5 be there? It should be there. Basically, think about every member in the big O of n is going to be all those with either whose highest power is either equal or strictly less. Okay? What about 7n plus 2? Yes, right? How about this? This one may take a little bit of thinking. Can I put five over here? Yeah, five here is actually even more trivial because you can think about a five here. It's basically five multiply n to the power of zero, right? It's also strictly zero, okay? Strictly less. So now I'm gonna give you another interpretation over here. You can either think about all the function that can be upper bounded by n times c, okay? 
Think about another way. That's one way to think about it. And the second way. All the functions whose highest power is less than or equal to, so here we like n to the power of one, right? Just that. So that is bigger of n. How would you draw bigger of n square? Do you think it has anything to do with big of n? Would it be a strictly larger set, like a superset, right? What you learn in the set theory. Okay, I'm gonna draw that over here. If you think about it over here, okay, if I want to draw another big set over here, it's gonna be big O of n to the power of two. Okay? Basically what we are saying is can two n upper bounded by n squared. Yes, very easily, right? Because uh, it's strictly larger power, n squared. Can you give me a member that is over here, but not here? n squared square plus one. Can now, so now you want to ask yourself, why n squared plus one is not a member of big O of n? Why? You want to think in this way. How do we prove that is the case? If you want to prove it, that means you want to choose a C that is so large, such that C multiply N is going to be asymptotically larger than or equal to M squared plus one. If you do a little bit more, why is this not the case? Okay? To prove, you will have to choose C such that C multiplied by N is larger than or equal to N squared plus one. And there's no such C, basically. C even, doesn't matter how large you choose. It just cannot be the case, okay? Because if you think about the diagram over here, if, uh, let's say, N squared plus one, basically, it would just go much steeper like this. And then, it doesn't matter what a linear function you choose, doesn't matter how steep it is, you will never catch up, never, ever, okay? Uh, I want to go a little bit further to what you just said. I'm gonna mention that anyway. Let me, the diagrams are getting a little bit messy. Let me just redraw it, okay? Let's think it this way. Let's say this is basically the family of big O of one. Give me some example, please. Well, function can be upper bounded by big O of one, by one. One, sure, two, three, five, 100, right? All the constant, right? And now that's, a, that's the smallest one. Wow, yes, constant will be the smallest one. And now you can have a superset over here. Let me see, big O of n, which is linear. And now, what it, apparently one can be upper bounded by something times n, right? Also two can be upper bounded by something times n as well. So you can think about big O of one, it's a strict subset of big O of n. That's not a problem, okay? Let me just put something here. For example, 2n, 3n, 4n, 7n, plus one. Okay, let me just do one more and then I'll explain what you just said, okay? Let me just put another guy here. Big O of n squared. Apparently, 2n can be upper bounded by n squared very easily, right? Because asymptotically, n squared is much steeper than linear, okay? So what cannot be upper bounded by n over here is, for example, n squared plus two. Two uh, n squared minus three, also seven n squared plus seven, etc. okay? So now, back to your question. Let's say this. If I have my running time function like this, 7n plus two, okay? Can I say it is big O of one? Can I say that? Apparently I cannot because there's no way for me to choose such a large uh, factor C, such as C times one is going to asymptotically be up larger than you would do 7n plus two. That's not possible, okay? Okay, this is simply not good, okay? 
But now, can I say 7n plus 2 is big O of n? Okay, that's good. Now, can I say 7n plus 2 is also big O of n squared? Is that correct or not? There's a notion between correct versus accurate. Okay? Let me draw another one just to really convince you. Okay? Actually, this one is really important, right? Okay? Big O of 1 is over here. Big O of n. Big O of n squared. Okay, so now we know that 7n plus 2 is exactly over here, right? Apparently, it is a member of this purple circle. It's also a member of the superset of the purple circle, which is blue, right? And also, it would not be hard to imagine, you also get all the uh, strictly larger highest power. For example, O to the power of 4. That's also there, right? So now, you can definitely say the following. 7n plus 2 is big O of n. That's the lowest one you can say. You can also say it's an n to the power of 2, big O of n to the power of 3, and all the way. Okay? So now, which one should you say? It's more about worst case we're talking about, right? If you say the worst case I can take for each method, let's say hello world. Hello world itself is a constant method. I can also say uh, hello world is also a quadratic in the worst case, but that's not accurate. Okay? So now these two are over here, so they are correct but not accurate. Because you can see this is certainly a member of this set over here. It's also definitely a member of this larger set over here. But it doesn't really make sense to go further. You want to choose the smallest family you belong to. How about that? Mm -hmm. If that makes sense to you. Exactly. So later on, when you were asked about the uh, asymptotic upper bound, we usually say the tightest asymptotic upper bound. I'll write it down. Okay? It's mentioned in the slide as well. So every time you want to decide the asymptotic upper bound, you want to choose its tightest. So this guy over here is so-called the tightest asymptotic upper bound. Okay. All right. <coughs> We got about five minutes. Let's see. Let's do a little bit more. Okay. Okay, guys. That's the uh, basic definition for big O. We already covered that. Okay. Please review the mathematical definition. You might use that uh, in the exam. Okay. That's the equation you should know. And then we're going to use this again. It's really important to see whatever c the mo uh, multiplicative factor you choose, and also the n zero, the starting point. Okay. We're going to see. And then uh, there are different ways you can say about the big O. You can either say f of n, <coughs> excuse me, f of n is a member of the big O of g of n. It's like a member. It's a set of functions. That's one way to go. Or you can simply say is big O of g of n. Or you can say it's a, an order of g of n. All of them work. Okay, you can choose either one. But I will typically just use number two, just easier to say. Just say is. Okay, that's something we just covered. Okay. So now, what would be the strategy to actually uh, decide the asymptotic upper bound? Okay? Let me tell you the strategy first. We'll do the proof in the beginning of uh, Wednesday. That's what we will do. <clears throat> so now, first of all, uh, let's say a m plus 5. So when you see the... Um, Let's say that's the running time, okay, for your function. Okay, let's say that's this, okay? So now, what would be the asymptotic upper bound? Well, you simply choose the highest power, n to the power of 1, okay? So this is big O of n. First of all, easy to determine. Just choose the highest power. How do we prove this? <clears throat> this is how you prove it. <clears throat> 
Usually, you have to choose C, and then such that N0 is equal to something. That's kind of the proof uh, pattern, usually. Okay, we'll go a little bit more detail next time. But for now, how do you choose the C? You're going to add up all the multiplicative constant together. So you got A here, you got 5 here. Okay, so it's going to be A plus 5, which is 13. Okay, so now what N0 should be depends. I would say typically this would just be 1. Which means once you choose the C, so that means you're going to have start, uh, if you have this, what does that mean? That means starting from N larger than or equal to N0, which is 1, we have basically 13 multiplied by N over here, which G of N, larger than or equal to a n plus 5. Is that the case? You want to plug in a number, right? That's something we've got to plug in. For example, over here, you can see if it is 1, right? So now, if this is 1 and this is 1, you got exactly 13 larger than or equal to 13. So upper bound effects start at exactly this point, okay? But the 1 over here, I only said is typically the case. There might be some cases that's not exactly 1. You have to be careful especially when log is, avail uh, is involved, okay? Let's do some exercises quickly, okay? Yeah, and then we'll definitely get into applying this to code next time. Oh, by the way, so this is something you can uh, also try to draw a table to see how you will get to that starting point, right? In this particular case, if you only choose C to be 9 rather than 13, you can still get there. You just take longer to get there. Rather than C and C are being equal to 1, it's now 5, okay? That's something uh, I'll let you read it. Let's do one example quickly. And this guy here, I'll mention this proof maybe next time, okay? This will take a little bit of time to explain. Okay, I'll get there. And this one, I'll also mention that next time, but this is exactly what we just explained about the uh, superset, okay? Okay, let's do this. <coughs> let's do one or two together. Let's say my running time is 5n to the power of 2 plus 3n log n plus 2n plus 5. So now, what should be the tightest asymptotic upper bound? By the way, if I only ask you about what's the asymptotic upper bound, you can always tell me it's 2 to the power of n. It's not the tightest, right? So now I'm asking the tightest. Mm -hmm. Well, choose the highest power, n squared, okay? It's n squared over here. And now, how do you prove it? In order to prove it, you have to give me two things. Number one, you're gonna, you want to tell me C times N squared is going to be larger than or equal to 5N squared plus 3N log N plus 2N plus 5. Starting from certain points, you got to give me, give me these two numbers. What should be C? Well, as we said before, you simply add out the multiplicative constant, okay? So what I would do is, uh, let me do, just do this together with you, and then we'll, I'll start from, uh, I'll resume from here next time. Let me just do this one. 5n squared plus 3n times log n. And by the way, if I didn't say it, log n, the log should be 2 based. Okay? n uh, plus 2n plus 5. Okay. Okay, so now it should be big O of n squared, simply because it's the highest power. Okay, that one's very easy. How do we prove it? Okay, I will simply choose C, which is going to be the multiplicative constant to n squared, right? I will simply add up all the multiplicative constant in the original formula. 5, 3, and also 2, and also 5. Add them up together. Okay, uh, 8, 10, and 15. So now, what would be n0? Would it be 1? We're going to try, OK? What you're going to try is like this. If you choose uh, c to be 15, you're going to ask yourself this question. I'll only tell you the formula. You can check it, and then we'll start from there next time, OK? So now we're going to check. Uh, starting from 
n is equal to n0, the following should hold, okay? So 15 multiplied by n squared should be larger than or equal to 5n squared plus 3n times log n plus 2n plus 5, okay? Next time, before next time, think about what should be n0 over here. Okay, why don't you do this exercise quickly before next time, and then we'll start from there. Okay, and then next time we'll apply this to the code. Okay, I'll see you on Wednesday. <laughs>